Hey, what's up everybody? So, um, I'm following up with this tutorial so that I can explain more about vibrations in terms of technical means. And um, I have my agenda here for what I want to explain today and it's basically going to be a little bit of systems overview and, and um, what are we going to use from systems into this. I'll talk about uh, three main spring mass systems uh, setup that helps um, model force vibrations. I'll talk about the types of vibrations more often, in, uh, more in depth of uh, in terms of their signal and uh, the different system parameters, and then I'll move on into uh, some signal analysis introduction, uh, very basic stuff. I'll explain window more and uh, filter more in depth, just because I think they're awesome, and then I will show you something uh, that I've modeled with some defects and and the idea that I've used. And then maybe like, you know, talk a little bit about optimization and controls and how to actually, um, and how to actually take that to the next step. So this way, you know, you have an idea about how these things are used in the industry and um, yeah, how like, you know, the, the vision and perspective on things we can do with them. They're pretty awesome. All right, so I guess let's start. I'll keep this down here. Okay, so let's start, right? Um, first thing I want to talk about obviously when, when I talk about vibrations is I want to talk about what is a vibration right so I want to just you know draw something here real quick which is it's simply you know oscillations going on forever right vibrations is in in its definition kinetic energy right um, so that being said it, like any kinetic energy Right, it's gonna dissipate and it's gonna change forms into something else, right? But in terms of what it is in itself, it is some kinetic energy and some movement, right? That's quantified with some type of you know amplitude, right? So some let's say force, um, acceleration, whatever, or whatever you wanna, um, however you wanna define it. And then uh, basically, yeah, over time. So when talking about vibrations, uh, we need to understand, like I mentioned last time, right? Uh, the whole light concept is that, you know, this signal right here that we see, right? Usually they're, they're modeled as sinusoidal waves uh, vibrations or harmonic vibrations, which I'll explain later. So um, they can go on forever, right? They can oscillate ideally or theoretically they oscillate forever therefore you know there are some system controls or, or a way for us to be able to identify you know system model parameters right so to how what affects the system number one and two how can we control that system so I guess from there let me let me you know jog your memory on a couple of things is that you know uh, Number one is equations of motion. The Newtonian equ equation of motion is that you know you can describe uh, any equation of motion um, with a simple with a simple um, x. Well, again, I'm talking right now. I'm talking about linear one degree systems, right? So uh, mass um, mass times acceleration plus some friction happening, right? Um, plus not sure why I put a dot on the C. Let me take that out. <laughs> so yeah, plus that plus kx equal to some force or something, right? Something happening. And again, this is coming from if I have if I have a body here, right? So let's say I'm gonna tap a 3D body, right? That 3D body, if I would to do so, a free body on it, right? I would have, let's say, gravity working on it, um, resisting gravity with some forcing function. Maybe it's on a wall here, so there is, you know, some friction force acting against it. You know, or depending on how it's moving, I'm just assuming it's up just to start. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the body um, dynamics, you know, can act as a spring. Or actually, you know what? To make this a little um, I'm just going to assume, you know, there are some spring holding it up there. 
right? But I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can model most of the systems as a, you know, as this this free body diagram right here. Let me take that. That was that was stupid. All right. So, let's go into examples, right? I mean, so first of all, before I go into examples, so this is an important thing, you know, the Newtonian equation of motion. Another important equation is that you can describe a, a system model, like, and, and, you know, characterize its parameters through the equation of x squared plus 2 zeta omega n plus omega n squared. So this here is another important equation. This helps you, you know, char characterize the model, like the parameters of the system, right? Um, this equation here, you know, if, if you were to solve this equation's roots, um, the roots of this equation will be negative alpha j omega d. Now, this this equation is actually, you know, it's, it, it, it helps you describe what they call the root and zeros of this um, of the system. I'm not going to go very much in detail about it, but let's say if I have my the roots of my system sit, you know, right there and I've identified them, this being this being alpha and this being omega d on a complex root, right? I can I can describe, you know, based on my description here, I can find out tons of information about how the system reacts. And not only that, but I can actually put roots in the system that helps me control it. I'm not going to dig much into this because this is system dynamics, right? And I would leave this for a different tutorial. So if you guys want it. So this is my quick and dirty system dynamics. I apologize if it doesn't look very well, but uh, this is my sketching ability on a computer. I haven't used this tablet before. Um, I owned it for like four years, but never used it. All right. So... <laughs> Let's go into the next step, right? Which is okay. Let's have let's have a quick example. You know, one of the most used examples for vibrations that was too crooked is um, is you know is the spring mass system. So I have a, this is spring mass system. So again, this is one degree of freedom, right? Hence X, XFT, one degree of freedom. Uh, I have a forcing function acting on it, right? This is, this is an example of force vibrations. And um, trying to excite the system. I'm trying with an external force. I'm trying to move that system, right? So right away, if if I were to look at this, I would quantify my equations. You know, I'd say, okay, the first thing I want to do is get my force. So, m x double dot, right? And my force in the system, right? To quantify all the forces in it, is going to equal to the forcing function because that's that's the more dom or at least it looks like it's the more dominant one right i say right a lot please pardon that uh minus you know whatever friction is happening or dampening occurring minus uh the spring constant or, or whatever you know uh, spring force is being applied on it right away when you see this i can say okay this equation right here comes down to you know, if I were to rearrange it, is that f of t is equal to m x double dot. When I say x double dot, it's obviously of t. I'm just doing double dot so that I save a lot of a lot of space for myself. So uh, mass x double dot, which is the force um, x dot, you know, whatever force is left acting on the system, um, plus the friction, plus the the um, spring the spring factor right away when you see this I see an opportunity is like okay maybe I can attempt to solve this equation or put a solution for it right away easiest thing to do to solve this equation is put it into Laplace right so let's Laplace transform this equation so I have f of s 
equal to ms squared, remember your Laplace rules, they're very important, right? Uh, plus cs x over s plus k x of s, right? When I look at this, you can you can easily extract a, a transfer function out of that to describe the system. I will rearrange things a bit here, but uh, the transfer functions of my input. Why is this my input? Simply imagine that you know this is my plant. My plant is you know the model of what's happening here, and what I'm what I'm inputting. Sorry, x of s is the output, but what I'm inputting is that forcing function. So I'm putting that forcing function in, and I'm coming out with some response in distance. So, you know, um, so in order to model transfer functions, transfer functions is usually output versus input. So versus input, and this will give me here my one over ms squared plus cs plus okay okay so that's dividing dividing through and you know um saturating the um, x of s i don't like using the term saturating especially because many of people who see this goes right away classical controls and saturating is a whole big field in classical controls or a whole area in classical controls. All right, so right away when I see this, right, I say, okay, this is my system, right? So this this looks like an open loop, um, an open loop system. Okay, I'm not gonna describe open loop system, we, uh, like the idea of open loop system. Again, this is classical controls and I don't wanna go there today, but I can say that the system is constrained and then model that and I can say that this bottom equation here I would like to put it in the same form as s square plus 2jw um, s plus omega n squared this way I can get uh, my model parameters and simply um, let me just move this down here so this way I can get my modal parameters and I can you know get it, um, characterize the system in terms of natural frequency in terms of damping constants so right away when I see this you know I have to go through and divide the system divide the m through so that will give me that s square plus C of M, C over M, S, plus K over M is equal to S squared plus two, oh, this is not a J. I'm not sure why I wrote that as a J. Zeta, so this is, this is, both of those are Zetas. Zeta omega M plus omega M squared. Okay, all right. So right away, I can see the connection here, right? Omega n is equal to square root of k over m. So I can describe right away my natural frequency uh, as a square root of k over m. Another, another thing I can explain, right? Or I can get from here is my damping constant. I can get an equation for my damping constant. So I have c over m is equal to two zeta omega n. So this way I can isolate zeta, or zeta, I can isolate zeta as c over 2m omega n, substitute in omega n to get c over 2 square root of um, k m. So this over here equal to zeta. Ooh, that is too far. So this over here is my damping constant. And th that here can help me identify, you know, wh what is 
or how to control my system. Now, I again, I'm trying to use the term control lightly, and I'll explain why right now. So I've mentioned to you before that there are, you know, three types of systems, right? When, I mean, there's actually more like two. The third one is in, in them, but we have the free vibration, right? And the force vibration. Free is, like we mentioned, um, free is oscillating system, right? Usually with the oscillating system, you can, you can describe it with some omega n, right? They usually have one or two natural frequencies and they're, for the most part, you know, easy to quantify and model. And they happen occasionally just because of how the system is set up. The force is usually you are forcing the system to have different omega ends. So a great example of that, by the way, I, I really don't like modeling this like that. Let's, let's do this and disregard this here. <laughs> um, but um, a good example of forced, right, is a system that's going and then dying down, right? So this is a damn system. This is a system that I am forcing to behave in a certain way, right? So that being said, you know, that, that damping obviously correlates to what Zeta is, you know, to my damping constant and how system overall with the roots interact. But, you know, I can have a system like this or a system that's very, you know, over damped. Here we go, right? So, this system here is usually what creates resonances, you know, which is a great deal of energy put in there because you are forcing the system to act in a certain way. And they usually have many resonances, you know, you, you can have a system acting like this and such. So this is being um, time over amplitude. So, okay, great. So we've described, I'm going to say this is time. Yeah, so we've, we've described this. Let's, this is not time, this is frequency. My God, I'm messing up today. All right, so we've described these things here. Um, let's, let's go a little deeper. Okay, so I will move this way. All right. Okay, so now that we described the types of vibrations that exist, right? Um, the ones that we're going to be talking about today is harmonic vibrations. Harmonic vibrations means they're happening over and over and over again, right? This is this is what I showed you an example of right here. Let me go back. But that's that's what I showed you an example of right here. These are these are harmonic vibrations, and these are are usually quantified. F is equal to, or you know, instead of F F of T, is equal to um, F naught sine of omega t so you know these are your typical um, um your typical harmonic vibrations where f of naught depends excuse me on on the damping and and you know this is my gain here so it it depends on how the system is behaving or how the the how your system parameters are so let's let's talk more about how can we actually understand this vibration and quantify them and maybe put them to use. So let's say I have I have a signal here. So let me talk a little bit about signal processing to how we can translate the signal. Before I go into this, right, I want you to imagine with me that you have you have an event, right? That event is happening three times, right, every second. So it has the frequency of the event is equal to one over three, right? Horrible number, uh, let's say four times per second. So, you know, 0 0.25 Hertz. This is super wrong. Four times per second, okay? Four Hertz. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's happening four Hertz, right? And you are collecting data. Your data is looking something like, again, most likely the data that you're collecting are harmonic unless there's some impact or some discontinu 
uh, this continuity is happening in there. So most likely you're connecting something like this, you know. Okay. Very rough, very bad sketch. This is your time data. So this is time versus amplitude. Okay. So when you take this data, you put it into something called an FFT. Fourier transfer, uh, Fourier, um, fast Fourier transfer function, which basically what it does is that it takes a piece of the data. Okay, so let me, in order to talk about this better, let me clean things up. So I have, I'm collecting some data like this. Okay, so what the Fourier does is that it comes in, takes a little piece of the data, right? And it assumes that this data is continuous and it goes on like this forever. Obviously, you know, and it ends, uh, sorry, it's continuous and it, and it ends, the data ends. Obviously in real life, you can, you can, you know, put in an impact and it will just keep going forever. You know, it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you will have this type of behavior and then it will, keep going on forever and if you were to look at the small little piece here you will still have <laughs> you'll still have some oscillations going on again it's going on forever so the Fourier transfer assumes that it is continuous right but it's not infinite it's it's a signal that it's a finite signal so if I were to let's say take some continuous data here right I will have some frequency again I know that an event is happening at 4 Hertz so what the Fourier transfer is that it takes time data, time data and amplitude, and it helps me see how, like what frequency is this data happening at. So I can see clearly, I was like, okay, this is, this is my four hertz right there, right? It's happening right there. So this is, this is the first thing I wanna talk about when I'm starting to describe um, signal processing. Okay. So let's take a bigger look, right? And say, okay, here's my data. Here's the data I was looking at before, right? So let's say I know that my Fourier took from here to here. So what if, what if it's not enough? What if I need to go a little longer or my data that was captured is a little longer, right? Come from here to here, for example. So you can see if, if you were to take this data so I'm gonna call this A and I'll call this B. If I was to take A and and repeat what's going on in A, right, I would have this going on. If I were to take B and repeat what's going on in B, right, I would have this going on. Right, so I'm having some discontinuity happening here. And this is, this is where you get some spectral leakages because over here, if I were to look at the FFT, right, I will see a clear frequency, right? And that's, that's a frequency that I know is my event happening at. But if I were to take this here, what I would see is I would see this right well this is probably see it a little wider right and why is that it's mainly because I'm having some leakage going on through my system so I have I have some leakage because I didn't capture so this is B here right this is B and this is a this is a I have some leakage going on and it's mainly because I I didn't I didn't um, take the correct sample to look at okay so this is this is where windows come in right so I'm gonna briefly discuss the math of the windows but I'm not gonna go much into it so you know I have I have some data going on right at the f of t form I think this is omega t, t yeah 
So I have so I have some data going on in the Omega farm, right? And what I'm assuming here is that my data is happening, you know, somewhere where it's basically ones and every every place else is zero. Right? So this is really the area that I'm taking to put into my FFT and such. So what I'm doing here is that I'm coming and say, okay, you know what? I'll, let's let's convolve let's convolve this function with a window. So let us use for for those of you who doesn't know what convolve means, it means you're combining a function with another function. So let's add a window where I can actually clearly define my area. So so in in better sense, you know what I'm saying here is that. I'm going to have these two functions right combined. And what I'm trying to do right is that if I were to look into the time domain, for example, uh, let's take a window called a, re a rectangular window. This is where my angles are getting weird because the tablet is getting weird. Okay, so let's say something like this. So this is this is the rectangular window, and you would have you know. This is in the time domain, and it would allow it would basically cut everything very sharply, right? And it would leave whatever is in the middle. So this way, when I when I move this into the frequency domain, right, I have something like this. So that's that's what my rectangular window is doing is that it's trying to kill side lobes right away or is it? but it's not usually the best main reason of because of that shape here is allowing for a lot of um, discontinuities to happen you can see the sharp drop right away versus for example let's, let's the hamming window right let me let me go a little deeper here because I'm writing on the edge of my notebook. <laughs> so, Hamming window, for example, in time domain, would look something like this, right? Where where it's kind of fading in the side lobes, and this way, when you when you are plotting it, right, you would have a good emphasis on the middle part, but you're also capturing, you know, some side information. I mean, what what it's doing is that it's it's greatly saturating those. I think it's like somewhere around the forty-one dB or such, but but it's still giving you a good emphasis on on the main lobe, and then it's decreasing the side lobes a lot. Therefore, you know, it it might not. Obviously, when you put in a window, it will affect signal to noise ratio, right? It will it will degrade the the quality of your signal, but it will allow you to see it better, because you are cleaning, you know. The things that are or the leakages that are happening that might be giving you misinforming you about things so when you do something like this right you're still have you're you're making sure you're not having any discontinuity in the data where when you look at the data you see spectral leakages it's helping you get more um, continuous data and data that is you know a little more appealing to us as human because I mean we make a lot better assumptions uh, based on continuous or, or visually appealing or easy to differentiate data. So yeah, so this is this is just a quick view into Windows. So what Windows do basically is that they come in and they make sure that that, that finite um, signal that you are getting right is continuous and it doesn't have any leakage happening because of you know the way you are sampling the data or collecting the data. So moving forward, right, I want to talk also a little bit about filters. Uh, filters are, is a very easy deal, right? So what the, filter is, is ha what the filter is doing here is that it is, you might have seen this a lot, but basically what it's doing is that it, this is an example of a, of a high pass filter, which, you know, obviously you have some F here and it would allow all the high frequencies to pass and it would kill all the um, all the low frequencies and vice versa on vice versa on you know the bandwidth so you have 
a one where you a filter where you can actually control the middle part or you have a filter where you can um, you know pass low frequencies and kill high frequencies so filters are very intuitive and very easy to use actually as a matter of fact before I move forward I would like to show you um, I think MATLAB has a really cool thing here that can help me discuss windows um, so you know this is looking at a Hamming window you can see um, it, it gives you a time domain in a way that would that would allow you to have some um, some information about other frequencies in here versus for example if I were to switch right into a rectangular window right I would have that top it's, it's not showing it very well but it's just the top and then the bottom just drop right away so anything above anything over 64 it would be just zero right away it would kill it so you're getting the most information there and you know the signal is is has obviously some discon discontinuity going for it you can see that if you MATLAB is actually really cool about that that you can see here that the leakage factor is um is a nine percent so it's a it's a high leakage factor where if i went to um hanning for example or hamming uh let's let's look at hanning right you can see that the leakage factor is significantly reduced right okay so i thought i thought this was a cool way you know to visualize and, and see it right away better than my horrible drawings all right so um yeah, so this is this is filter. It's 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 very easy. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, or two actually more things I want to talk about real quick about signal processing before I move on to uh, just showing you some examples is noise. Um, so obviously, what it, in whatever you are getting, you will have some noise. So let's say, you know, this is some data, right? your noise will ride on it like this you know because you have you have some random things happening and there's so many models of noise on there the one that i'm going to be using today is a white um is a white gaussian noise and uh, again it's just some noise from the electrical lines from everything happening around you um you can actually noise is a big deal because it might not sound like a big deal but it really depends on your application but if you're if you were to, for example, operate an electron microscope, most of the electron microscope that I know, or at least as I am aware, it's an industry standard to put them at the bottom um, of a building, right? Um, main reason is you're trying to avoid any vibrations getting to those or any noise getting to those. You're trying to um, saturate them as much as you can. This way they can actually give good data. So yeah, so noise happens everywhere. Uh, the big thing that I'm gonna be stressing here is um, signal to noise ratio right and what what that means is that um, if I have a noise happening here right and a signal so I'm gonna call this you know um, amplitude 1 and this is amplitude 2 right so my signal to noise ratio is gonna be a1 over a2 and that that basically would help me understand how separated is my signal from the noise? I know I've, I've mentioned it when I was discussing filters and I didn't explain it, so here you are the explanation for it. So yeah, and then another thing that I wanna go briefly over, again, this is, this is a brief overview, overview of the technicality of vibrations. If you want a specific topic, let me know. Uh, this way I can be a lot more focused in what I'm doing and maybe prepare a better agenda. Um, but uh, yeah, so sampling frequency really completely depends on what you're trying to see, right? So let's say uh, I'm going to take that example before, right? Where I know, you know, I have a frequency of four hertz happening. If I were to collect data at two hertz, I am not going to be able to see four hertz because um, simply I'm unable to get good resolution of what this is. So what I'll be seeing is, imagine, you know, this is the data here, and I'm having only like one point here, one point here, one point here, one point here. So for what it's worth, you know, what I'm seeing is there's a straight line. So maybe maybe the system is, maybe the system is overdamped, 
when the system in reality, you know, have a lot of damning to it. So this this matters a lot. I know that uh, there's uh, some NyQuest um, sampling rates out there and such where, you know, it's it's almost like a standard. If, if you're four hertz, right, you have to do eight hertz. Um, this is actually like uh, practice. It's like almost like a common standard. If you want to look at four hertz or that's what or that's the high um, the high uh, range of your of what you want to look at, you go to the double of that. Uh, hence why, you know, most of the music decks go to 40 or 44,000 hertz because they capture all the, all the way up to 20,000 hertz, which is the audible range. So, OK, cool. So what do I want to show you today? Well, let me skip to my small thing I have down here. OK, so I decided that it would be really cool if we can model something. So I went ahead and modeled a gearbox, right? So you have, you have two gears going. You have the pinion and you have the ring gear, right? Uh, I'm putting them under different tests, but let's just assume for now that I am just trying to understand the frequencies those guys will operate at, right? So I have, I have some interaction happening at, you know, section one here and that that interaction here is um is mesh right so i have the meshing of them so i would expect obviously the mesh to be the highest uh energy in the system to the highest the highest uh, contribution in the system mainly because the mesh is where most of the force is being transmitted and you know this is where all my power is. So I would expect this to be my highest contributor. And then I would expect the pinion to be my second highest contributor because the pinion would have a lot more, um, a lot more packed power that is trying to transfer to the ring gear. And then my ring gear to be my third contribu contributor, right? So this is, this is, you know, the way I'm modeling it. So I'm gonna have to get the frequency of the mesh. So obviously, you know, there are some teeth going on here. I assumed, you know, 11 teeth for the pinion. Uh, I assumed 41 for the ring. So I have a ratio basically of 373. Um, RPM, I, to start with, I think I, I made some assumption on RPM. I, I, don't, I don't remember what I wrote. But what I've done is that was just something to start with and then I've done a speed sweep. So what I haven't done here is that I assume that my system is the same, which I'll explain a little bit more once I show you the model. I have created basically some functions where I can add noise. Um, I can add a couple of defects uh, just for fun. So I wanted to add a distributive de defect and a uh, impact defect. So I've added a nick basically on a ring gear and a nick on a pinion, right? And then for the distributive, I've added um, side bands to the pinion and side bands to the gear. Basically, you wouldn't buy, wanna buy that thing. That thing is super noisy and it has a lot of problems, right? Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's what I've added here um, to my function, okay? So let me go ahead and compute my I think all my all my functions are here. They have all the uh, they have all the defects and such. So I made them in a way, you know, so that I can just I can just call on the function. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go ahead and explain my functions unless you guys want me to, and I can make another tutorial from MATLAB. But basically, what I've done is that I made the function in a way that you know, you, for a steady for a steady waveform, I would enter the types you know, the parameters that I want in there, whether I want sidebands or not, or whether I want uh, to to have a nick on the pinion or not. This way I can, you know, just model different systems. And then after that, I went ahead and modeled the, sweep, the speed sweep of the systems again with the same type of defects and such. All right, so go. let me go ahead and run my model so that we can discuss. So. Cool. All right, so let's discuss this. So I'm gonna put all my 
Ugh. Let me put all the stuff up here so we discuss what's happening. Okay. So what, what you're looking at here is, number one, you're looking at the simulated waveform. So this here is my simulated waveform. Um, I, I, assumed, I assumed that I'm going for... Um, I'm going for 23 seconds. So I put 23 seconds for the torque sweep, or not torque sweep, for the steady sweep, right? And then I put um, a 90 second for the speed sweep. So again, I simulated on a specific time and you can see actually um, my gear mesh is actually happening here. At, I don't remember what that is. Uh, but this is my gear mesh, 275. And you can see my sidebands here. You can see some impacts, some uh, impacts happening. First of all, harmonics of, of my ring gear and then some impacts happening, not ring gear, harmonics of the mesh and then some impacts. I have a lot of impacts happening from the, from the pinion. I, I can actually change this um, range so we can take a look at it better. Um, so yeah, this is, this is for modeling. So you can see that, you know, the data, so this is the whole vibration data, and this is only for the gearbox. So what I'm, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to add the drive lines to it. This way I can also see uh, the contribution of different resonances from the drive lines, from the pinion drive line, from the ring gear drive line. This way I can, you know, understand the whole resonances of the system and how things are. So yeah, so from there, I was actually able to derive a color map. Right. So this is kilohertz. Um, you can see that this is, which is what I would expect. I'm using rectangular window on both because what I'm trying to show you here is that, you know, I'm trying to show you all the things that the NIC did, which um, you might find some leakages. I think the speed, um, the, the speed sweep has a lot better, um, a lot better um, view of, of the different leakages happening because of the, because of the NICs and such. But um, but yeah, so you know you can see you can see the main the side bands are in there, but I didn't put like a pretty heavy side bands so that you can see them there in like orange, right? And then you can see some other things happening at the bottom. Again, I didn't assume any difference. Well, when I was doing side bands, I didn't want to go too crazy because I can when modeling side bands, I can take into consideration the assembly. So what I can do is I can optimize my functions so that I can find the perfect amplifications for my, for my sideband frequencies and then go through that and have a perfect model. But, well, a closer model to reality. But right now I wasn't interested in that. I was just interested in, in getting some model together, which I'll discuss later how I can optimize this and what's my next steps. Over here you can see the speed sweep where I'm actually sweeping from 500 hertz all the way up to 3500 hertz. Again, this is just the gearbox. That's why you're not seeing, you know, any frequencies going across or, or natural frequency of the system. I haven't added those yet. Um, I'm planning, you know, um, to, to maybe do another tutorial so that you guys can see the follow up on that where I can add bearing. Uh, I already have a model for bearing, but I just prefer not to add it to this one uh, with different defects and such. Um, and then uh, the drive line, adding the drive line, and then the next thing, which is going to be really cool, is that adding the motor controls, and how can you actually uh, control the motor differently to be able to optimize uh, where you want to test. So let's say you want to test in the window between, you know, 700 and 1,000 RPM. So what you can do is that you can actually change the controls of the motor and some different aspects of the drive line. Uh, again, I'll create a function that optimizes this right away where you can say, okay, I want to test between here and here. And it would go ahead and just optimize and clean everything for you and say, okay, you need to have that much weight of an inertia wheel, that much length, probably it's just going to be maximum of 2D function, which is just some, a, control, um, a control parameter, like a gain, uh, the PID loop of the motor, and then, um, and then just the inertia weight. But yeah, so this is this is really cool. Um, I uh, I'm not going too much in the power spectrum. This is I was just experimenting yesterday to see if if using the power spectrum I can uh, segregate my uh, pinion you know pulses 
uh, versus my ring gear pulses. This way, I can actually, you know, focus a lot more and see and see the see if I can, you know. Basically, I, I was um, how do I say this? I was checking sanity, checking my defects to make sure that when I put a pinion defect, I see it in the pinion. When I put a ring gear defect, I see it in the ring gear. So yeah, it's just just an added plot there. So yeah, so this is this is a really cool thing. That model is not complicated at all. It took me like maybe three hours to get together, uh, to put to put it together. But you know, you can see that you would have your main frequency happening here, and then you would have your your sidebands going on, and you can see some small things happening, and they're all from different noise and, and contribution from um, contribution from nicks on a ring on and nicks on a pinion. It's basically a really bad gear set. So. So yeah, so like I mentioned to you, it's it's really easy to have. Well, not really easy, but it's it's a simple idea for you to optimize this. So a speed a speed sweep, you know, um, or a ramp system. This is not a true speed sweep. This is just some estimate of what I think based on the steady state the speed sweep will look like. But obviously, depending on how your system is set up, maybe when you ramp responsive, you're gonna have things that are. Um, that are under damp, so you have overshooting somewhere, or you know, uh, you're gonna hit a hard spot after a resonance, and this is all gonna just carry over with you. Um, so, what I'm trying to get at is um, it, so let's take this model here, for example, and let's say, okay, I would like to do a torque sweep, right? So, doing a torque sweep, I'm actively applying torque on his teeth, so I'm actually changing. The way they interact so when i'm changing the way they interact i'm actually changing the contributions from the different side bands so what i can actually do right is i can go in uh collect act actual data for some samples and then i can come and say okay here is my estimated uh amplifications from the side bands and here is my actual side bands value so let's solve those together and let's basically get a matrix of amplifications throughout the different torques, right? And see if that holds up. See if if, if I were to change uh, the backlash, for example, or change the pinion position. Do I change the different amplifications so that maybe I destruct the signal or, or add on a signal and such? Because obviously your mesh is also going to be different depending on how you set it up. So you can you can add a mesh parameter, a, a mesh gain parameter, and that mesh gain parameter will be uh, affected by you know let's say the lapping of your teeth and, and such so when you take this data across the whole torque band uh, across the whole torque sweep you're able to optimize your matrix and maybe check your matrix maybe say okay so if I were to do this perfectly this way I'm expecting it to look like this and again it will give you some good insight I mean having a MATLAB script to do this is no biggie once you just match the sampling frequencies and such it's just as simple as just clicking a button to match like creating those matrices um yeah so this is you know this is for the build and for op optimizing a torque sweep as to optimizing a speed sweep the good thing is your tor torque is the same so for the most part you can actually model a high speed a high speed gearbox so let's say you're retaining your gearbox uh at crazy 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 speed like let's say 20,000 18,000 you're able to actually put that in right away and see uh, what how do resonances and and the different defects would look like under that speed and you know and and you can see the whole map of it and it will help you plan accordingly before before putting that gear set into a vehicle you know if you have a known if you have a known performance of a, um, of a vehicle or you might even want to try uh, adding this data so maybe um, maybe try you know um, superimposing this data on, on on another you know convoluting it with with some gear set that you know is very quiet again it's obviously very bad it's 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 somewhere to start right so you just get like some vehicle data or a very 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 quiet axle and then you add you know something to it obviously you're not gonna have the same scale because you're not testing out the same conditions and the DBs might be in different units and such um, but again it's, it's something to start what I'm trying to say is using these tools it can give you a very good insight on how to design something or how do you step into unknown territories 
uh, that could help you a lot into optimizing what you do and actually be able to, uh, how do I say this, not firefighting, be able to be a step back and actually know, okay, so I probably need to do this to stay away from that. And then, you know, like, like one of the major things that I didn't put in this is alignment, right? I mean, imagine, imagine if you have, um, so let's say here's my gearbox, right? Uh, and this is my output drive line, this is my input drive line. If I have a little bit of angle on this, obviously it will matter on the mesh, right? So this is, again, this is another thing that I didn't put in, but all of these things are, they are not hard. I mean, once you really figure out how your system is put together, as long as, long as you're, you know, constraining your system properly and making sure that, you know, you're not just throwing things at it because, uh, again, I'm not going to go so much into details, but, but let's say, you know, you know of some frequency F here, right? F of not. And that frequency F not, if you decided to dampen it using a dampener, right? I mean, you, you're basically what you're doing is that you're bringing this to zero. So you're, you're doing this. Right. So what you just did is that you created two frequencies, right? Which could be a great thing because this is your problem, but it could also be a bad thing depending on what's what's happening here. Um, you could your dampening, uh, your your dampening in the system can hugely affect how resonances behave. I mean, you can have based on the different dampening, they're not that sharp, but it's you basically, you know. As, as you move the dampening, you are moving your resonances. So these are these are the peak resonances. So you're, you're shifting the resonance around and you're actively changing the system. It can be a very complicated thing if you just don't know the model and you're just saying, okay, you know what, put this in, put this in, or you're trying to, you know, uh, a problem, a small problem, you're just trying to solve that problem and you don't care about how the whole system interacts, which, you, which could be great, but you could be also just, you know, throwing money in the garbage. And ultimately, you know, businesses are about making money. So doing your due diligence help a lot in terms of quantifying and, and staying ahead of all that. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. I apologize for this being long. I'm not sure how long it is. But, uh, yeah, I hope it was informative. Um, again, my, my train of thought is not very clear just because I'm trying to explain a lot of things. I, I do have an agenda, but I'm trying to, you know, fill all the gaps in as I go. If you have a specific question, I can I can do like um, like a four minute video to answer that specific question more in details with some with some um, calculations and such. Let me know, right? Um, I I think it's really cool. I think vibrations in general is a very cool concept, right? And any any system like most of the system you know will be modeled by three forms of of, uh, of spring mass systems. So you have the one we talk about, which is the external forces. Again, I just, like I said, I love talking about physics. So, um, so this is, this is, you know, you're actively adding an external force, right? You can have some just base excitation, which, you know, you have the same thing going on here. Sorry, my tablet is acting weird. And, uh, you have something going on here, right? And and then your X is this way, and then is is the same thing. Except, right, this is your base excitations. You're not actually applying an external force. Or, you know, you could be just rotating the system. So you have this here, right? So this is a model for rotating systems. Again, this is all linear 1D. Uh, sorry, one degree of freedom system. And you have, you know, you have some mass two, and that mass two, you know, is, is rotating. So it's creating, you know, some um, rotor excitations. So again, these, these, are all, these are all different concepts, but these three are the main to actually understanding how to model 1D systems. And, you know, obviously more complicated systems like a driveline, you're going to have to put a lot of different ones in here to actually be able to model it. Simscape is great for this. For Simscape, you can just put those in and put in um, the quantities and Simscape will just do the calculation for you and figure out the uh, state space equations and such. 
Cool. I hope, I hope this was informative. Uh, if you have any questions or, or maybe if you call me saying something wrong, please let me know. I'd love to correct my knowledge. Obviously, I don't know it all, but uh, um, let me know. And um, yeah, thank you very much for watching this. Thanks.